Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm Stella Tarney. I'm co-founder and executive director of Capital Nature. And Capital Nature is pleased to host you for this program, The Beauty and Magic of Winter Trees. And uh, we think there's no better day than Valentine's Day to send out a little love note to the trees that, that support us and improve our quality of life and that keep us good company, whether it's in our neighborhoods or backyards or parks. So we thought Valentine's Day was a special day where we could do this program. Um, Anna, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, Capital Nature? Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Kahanui. Um, I'm a Fairfax Master Naturalist living in Burke, Virginia. Um, I'm a certified forest therapy guide along with Melanie, um, nature nerd, iNaturalist user, um, nature photographer, and just really happy to be here. Um, Stella and I founded Capital Nature five years ago uh, to highlight the unique nature opportunities in the DC metro area. So we definitely love to promote uh, citizen science as well as forest bathing and other uh, stewardship activities. And so we hope you check out our website at capitalnature.org. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. And it's it's my real pleasure to welcome our two presenters, Melanie Chupas Bradley and Alonso Abugadas. Uh, if you know the naturalist community at all, then you know that these are two of our most um, respected and popular naturalists in the entire region. And Melanie is a is a renowned author. She's written over how many books have you written by now? I have seven published nature books, and I'm working on number eight. Number eight. <laughs> And, and the classic book, City of Trees, uh, which really has become a classic on trees in DC, was Melanie's first book, and it's our go-to book um, on many tree questions. So we're so pleased to have you, Melanie, and all of your naturalist knowledge uh, and skills. And Alonzo Abugadas is um, the Natural Resources Manager in Arlington County, but also he is the Capital Naturalist. And if you're on Facebook, you know that he's wildly popular. And how many uh, how many people are following Capital Naturalist right now, Alonzo? Uh, a little over twenty two thousand, I think twenty two thousand seven hundred. Wow. The last time I saw it, and you know, I'm very happy to support, of course, all the things that uh, that, that you guys do. And we get confused with each other all the time, which is okay too. <laughs> And we're forced, and also you have a blog spot. Uh, Alonso has written some wonderful blogs on various nature topics. And if we could put that in the chat, that would be great too. So we're honored and pleased to have both Alonso and Melanie with us to present kind of their view of the magic and beauty of trees in winter. And we're also honored to say they're on our advisory board. So, so friends meeting up on Valentine's Day. So what I'd like to do now is actually kind of introduce the why the winter, why winter trees. I mean, Valentine's great. We all love our trees, but there's something about trees in winter that's kind of special and magical. And the way I kind of see it is that you kind of see the forms of the trees. It's all kind of hidden under the green canopy, which we love. But then suddenly kind of they almost become like persons in the winter, you can see their architecture and their forms. And also February is kind of a dreary month, let's face it, it's the depth of winter and you kind of want spring to come. And then if you're in DC, we have these four warm days and we think everything's gonna bloom and it warms up and then the freeze comes back and we're like, nah, we're still in winter. So we thought also in dreary February, let's take a look at the trees um, because there's so much going on actually. Um, the beauty and then all of that ecology that happens and then the amazing folklore that becomes somehow even more precious during the winter months. So we're going to be hearing a lot about what makes trees special in the winter, okay. especially, and even some of the folklore and magic that surrounds them. Having said that, I also wanna mention, there are a number of you um, that participate in our summer tree walks. And we were so glad to see you in Deanwood, in Eckington and in Mount Pleasant. And I want to invite you first, if you could put in the chat, whether you were in those neighborhoods or in other neighborhoods, are there any special winter trees that kind of are very notable when you're walking in the neighborhood or looking in your yard where you're like, oh, I never noticed about that tree, but in winter, suddenly they kind of come to life. So please share that if you've noticed any special trees. If you happen to be in Eckington, I invite you to go to Lincoln Road and look at the amazing forms of the American elms. And you'll see they have a classic vase shape and you see how the canopies kind of go over the road. So winter on Lincoln Road in Eckington is, is pretty special. In Mount Pleasant, we've got the giant red oaks and suddenly you see the kind of 
horizontal form of those oaks. And that's really pretty special. And in, in Deanwood, there's an amazing willow oak. Um, it's suddenly you see that it's a grandmother, grandfather tree, and it looks especially stupendous in the winter. And then all the black walnuts and the catalpas have their various fruits either still on the, the tree or falling to the ground. And you can identify those trees by the fruits on the ground. A lot of things you can look for in each of those neighborhoods and in your own. So with that, um, let me go ahead and then invite Melanie to come and give her poetic. I saw the slides and the only word that came to mind was her poetic presentation on the amazing beauty of trees in winter. Melanie. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. And talking about poetry, whenever you speak, it's poetry. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I have such respect for Anna and Stella and all they have done with Capital Nature and in all aspects of their lives celebrating nature and ecology in our region. And Alonzo, you are in for such a treat, everybody, to hear Alonzo and the stories he tells about trees, the folklore, the herbal lore. I could listen to him all day. So I am going to try to pull up my slides. <laughs> As Anna and Stella know, and, and many of you know too, I'm a bit tech challenged, so I'll do my best here. Um, okay, I do not see the slides, Anna. We may need to go to a backup. Um, let's see, maybe I need to change my view on my screen before I share my screen. Yeah, try that. You know, what should I do for the view? Uh, you need to hit the view screen. You could do the speaker view maybe. Okay, I'll do speaker view and then I'll do share screen, but I don't see my presentation. That's the problem. Um, let's see, let me pull it up. Sorry, you guys. Okay. We will get it together here. It's always the tech. Everybody knows. Okay. So there is my presentation. I can see it. Okay. Um, and then just squiggle your mouse around a little bit. You'll probably see the Zoom. Um, the Zoom. Yeah, that's the problem. It's control. just not coming back. Um, let's see. Let me do this again. Okay. Here we go. Share screen. Oh, yes. We're getting there. There okay. we go. There we oh, go. And then, right. and then okay. go ahead and put it in slide view and you're all set. Okay. So Okay, are we Perfect. there? Are we Perfect. there yet? <laughs> okay, wonderful. So when first of all, I can't think of a way I'd rather celebrate um, Valentine's Day than with our collective love and appreciation for trees. I grew up in Vermont, so I love trees in the winter. We have we have winter trees for half a year in Vermont. And when I moved to Washington years ago, I was amazed by the beauty of the winter trees. This is a um, photo of uh, Haynes Point looking out toward National Airport. And of course, we have this lovely snow in this picture. And I am going to be showing you a few snow pictures. I wish we had the real thing. Um, but I haven't given up hope. I never give up hope until after the spring equinox. Um, but whether you have snow or not, the trees are beautiful in the wintertime. And I learned to appreciate their, their architecture with, with the leaves down, you know, a silhouette against the sky. Um, the photographs I'm going to be sharing with you, if there's no photo credit, that means that I took the photo. Um, many of these are by Susan Austin Roth, who did the photography for my book, A Year in Rock Creek Park. This is Boundary Bridge. This is the little footbridge that takes you from Maryland to DC in Washington in Rock Creek Park. Um, and um, I'm going to start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you to three main places in this presentation. We're gonna start in Rock Creek Park, and then we're going to go to the Potomac Gorge and then to, to Capitol Hill. So I love Rock Creek Park in the wintertime. And especially when you have a snowfall like this, um, these are the um, box elders. The box elder is actually a type of maple. It's also called ash leaf maple. And this is more what they look like this winter. Um, they grow all along our creeks and rivers, and they're quite easily identifiable in the wintertime. If you look at the photo in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the twigs are green. The twigs are often green. Um, the bark that's shown in that lower left-hand corner it's, um, it's kind of a, a tan color and it's shallowly grooved. And the trees love to grow right along the water. 
And you often see um, samaras on the female trees. Um, it's a dioecious species, so only the female trees produce fruit. And the samaras remain on the tree into the winter. I think our most stunning winter tree in Washington, are you able to hear me, Anna? Am I coming through okay? Yes, you are. Perfect. Okay. Sound perfectly. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So um, I think Anna and Stella and probably Alonso will agree with me that the American sycamore in the wintertime is absolutely stunning. Um, the whitened limbs, you know, when the leaves have fallen, and you can really appreciate the upper limbs, which are whitened. And then you have these fanciful dangling dancing fruit balls. <laughs> That's not the technical name of them, but um, there they are in the left upper left hand corner there. They hang down. They're going to break up soon and each little individual fruit is attached to these hairs that turn into a parachute and they can actually fly and then float along the creeks and rivers. Now, um, when you're along the Anacostia or the Potomac or, or Rock Creek or any of our other creeks and rivers, um, you're, when you see that whitened tree, it's going to be the American sycamore. But if you're in the city proper in a, you know, along a street or in a park, you're more apt to see the London plane tree, which is a hybrid of our sycamore and the oriental plane. And I put this picture in on the lower left hand so you can see it's kind of hard to see. But if you see on a, a tree um, any of those fruit balls hanging, dangling in pairs or even in threes, that's going to be a London plane. Some of them will still be single, but if you see any pairs at all, it's very likely a London plane. Um, uh, Stella was talking about the beauty of our American elms with their vase-shaped um, canopies or crowns. <clears throat> right now, um, this, these are the buds of the American elm about ready to pop. Right now, the American elms are already blooming. They are either at this stage where the buds just look so ready to pop or they're actually flowering. I was on the National Mall um, a couple of days ago, and, and many of the elms there, the American elms, are already blooming. Uh, Dutch elm disease was devastating, but fortunately, we still have a lot of American elms along our rivers and streams in the, in the floodplain forest. And uh, these trees that I'm showing you here at the outset are all trees of the floodplain forest. This is the pawpaw. I love the pawpaw twig in the wintertime. The, uh, the terminal bud looks like a little paintbrush. And then the, the lateral buds are round and fuzzy. And then when you watch the buds in the winter, when the, spring, when the flowers pop out in the spring, it's a real treat. It's an early blooming tree. And of course, this later produces a delicious fruit. It's also the host plant for the zebra swallowtail butterfly. And if you walk along our, our rivers and streams, you'll often see those butterflies early in the spring flitting along among the among the pawpaws. Another tree of the floodplain forest is the ironwood, hornbeam, or musclewood. I think musclewood might be my favorite name for this tree because it really looks, it, you, I think you can see in the picture on the left hand um, that it's very sinewy and, and muscular looking, almost like somebody who's been to the gym. And um, the, the musclewood grows all along our creeks and rivers again in the floodplain forest. And then this is another woody plant. It's not a tree, but it is a woody plant. It's a shrub, um, spice bush. And I love the winter flower buds. Some of our trees and shrubs have buds that everything pops out of the same bud, all the flowers and leaves. But, um, but some of them have separate um, flower and leaf buds, as does the spice bush. And these little buds, the only way I can describe them, this is a really good botanical term, they're adorable. <laughs> And, um, and I just love seeing those buds when I'm walking along Rock Creek. And then I know that they're going to pop out very, very early in the spring into this symphony of beautiful yellow flowers. And then later in the year, the fruit that forms on the spice bush is a really important food for migrating birds, including the wood thrush, which is our official bird in D.C. American hollies are very prevalent in our, in our natural parks. Um, and, and they're a really good um, late winter food source for birds. I notice in my neighborhood um, that, you know, late in the year, right around now, all of a sudden the robins will just descend on the, on the hollies and, and feast on the fruits. Now, when you're out looking at winter trees in Rock Creek Park, do not neglect the skunk cabbage. <laughs> 
it's not a tree, but I consider skunk cabbage one of the wonders of the world. Those spathes, those red speckled spathes look like meat, they smell like kind of like rotting meat, and they attract pollinators that are attracted to animal carcasses to go in and pollinate the, the tiny true flowers there in the spadix in the center. Um, and the fact that a, that a plant would know how to imitate meat to attract those pollinators is just, I mean, think about that. And they can also generate their own heat. It's called thermogenesis. And the heat that they generate um, is a further attraction for insects in the wintertime. And also they can melt right through the ice and snow. And I'm still hoping they'll have a chance to do that this winter because I'll never give up my hope for snow until the equinox. Now, one of the most wonderful things to do in the wintertime is to sit or stand or lie under a tulip tree and look up the tree and look up to those um, samaras um, that are, that are on, the, on the twigs. They are wing, uh, a samara is just a, a winged single seeded fruit. And on the tulip tree, they grow in a cup shaped formation, kind of a tulip shape formation. And when the sun shines on them, they turn gold. And it's like, it's like candelabra. It's one of my favorite winter sites in Rock Creek Park. There they are close up on the left. Um, and then when it snows, it's almost like ice cream cones <laughs> with vanilla ice cream. And then when you get a fresh snowfall, you'll notice if you walk in any of our parks along the trail, you'll see all of the um, Samaras on top of the snow. They're a really important food for, for birds and animals during the winter. Cardinals love them. The bud of the tulip tree, and of course, in the winter, one of the features that we can focus on and appreciate are the buds of trees. I, you know, I really focused on those um, spice bush buds, and I love the tulip tree bud. It looks almost like a duck's bill. And then when it opens in the spring, um, there, there it is opening in the spring. It, it's just magical. And you can take a tulip tree um, twig now and slice a bud. And you might not want to do it. It might seem too cruel. But if you, if you take one bud and slice into it, you will find tiny little um, tulip tree leaves that are folded in half and tucked inside that bud. And then, of course, in the spring, when they, when they leaf out, one of the things I love about the tulip tree is that it just reaches for the sky. In my book about Rock Creek Park, I, de I describe it as being almost like a baby's hand reaching for the sky. And then um, when it blooms, you can see its magnolia family relationship. It's in the magnolia family. Now we're gonna go now from the floodplain forest um, of Rock Creek Park into the upland woods. And this is a real signature site in winter in Rock Creek Park, the American Beach with its silvery bark. And the American Beach has many winter features to focus on. Um, the leaves in the, in the big picture there in the center, those leaves are called marcescent leaves. They are leaves that stay on the tree after the chlorophyll is done. And on the American Beach, especially on the young trees, um, they, they turn this kind of bleached wheat color. It's kind of got a pinkish hue to it. And it's, it's such a signature sight. Even if you're just driving through Rock Creek Park or you know, riding on your bicycle, you will see these marcescent leaves of the American beech. The fruit um, is, is, is the beech nut. It's like a triangular smooth nut. Um, and they, they're, they um, are formed inside this prickly husk. Um, and they are a really important food source for all kinds of birds and animals. The bark I already mentioned is very smooth and silvery. And then in the lower left there, you can see the marcescent leaf. Now I'm gonna give you a homework assignment, a winter tree homework assignment. In the upper left-hand corner is a close-up of a beech bud. And this is your assignment. Find an American beech and then run your fingers up the bud, along the bud. You know, touch the tip too, so you can see how sharply pointed it is, but run your fingers along that bud. If you look at this picture, <clears throat> you can see that that bud has overlapping scales, imbricate scales, but when you run your fingers along that bud, it is as smooth as, as glass, just absolutely as smooth as glass. So 
that's your homework. Find a beach bud, run your fingers along it. And then if you really tune into those beach buds in the winter, in the spring, you will be in for such a treat because when they come, when the leaves come spilling out of those buds, it is so dramatic and wonderful. They are covered with silky white hairs. And then unlike the tulip tree, which, you know, the leaves reach for the sky initially, the beech leaves um, like kind of dangle toward the earth. In my Rock Creek Park book, I describe them as being like dancer's skirts. And it's fascinating to watch at bud break because eventually the leaves will all be horizontal on both these trees, but they start out with very, very different movement initially. Now, walking through Rock Creek Park in the winter, to me, it's, it's like a dazzling symphony <laughs> looking at the forest floor. When I look at this picture, I see there, I can see five different species of oaks there. There are white oaks, um, uh, northern red, southern red, um, I think black oak, scarlet oak, probably some chestnut oak, and also American beech. And just a symphony of leaves, they have a lot of tannin in them, and they, they stay, you know, they hold their form for a long time. And then when you, when you look at them and you think about how this is going to be the living soil, it is really a wonderful way to connect with the ecology of the forest. And we have magnificent oaks in Washington, and when an oak grows in the forest, it has to you know, make peace with all the trees around it. Um, but when it can grow out in the open, it can develop this big, wide crown. This is a post oak at the equitation field in Rock Creek Park. Um, beautiful tree. It's like a, it's a, more of a southern species <clears throat> that's in the northern part of its range here. You can see the leaf. I love the leaf. It's in the white oak group, which has rounded lobes. And it's got that, that's, first pair of lobes, is, it's almost like a cross. And then it has a pretty little acorn. There's the acorn you can just barely see at the base of the leaf. Now I wanted to talk about winter um, oak diagnostics because some of our most common oaks are really easy to identify by their bark. In the winter, you can just kind of scan through the forest and, and identify these trees. The northern red oak in the upper left-hand corner has um, we call them ski tracks. Um, there are these um, pale, um, shallow grooves that are kind of flattened that come down the tree and they look like ski, tr ski tracks. So that's the northern red oak. And I put the leaf next to it. It's in the red oak group, as the name implies. And the red oak group has pointed bristle tip lobes um, for the leaves. Then on the lower left hand corner is a chestnut oak. And that bark is very thick. And it, it's kind of like ridges and valleys, vertical ridges and valleys. There's the leaf, the, the chestnut oak is in the white oak group. It has a very shallowly lobed leaf. And then the um, common Eastern white oak has really distinctive bark. Um, you can see it's very shaggy and it's ash gray. It's like the color of ashes in the fireplace. I show you the base of it too, because the base does not look like that. When you're looking at the tree, and this is true with with the northern red too. You want to kind of look a little higher up um, to, to really see the shagginess. And then there is the leaf of the white oak, obviously in the white oak group. That is the uh, state tree of Maryland. And here are their acorns. I love acorns. I, I love, with oaks, I love all the variations on the theme of the leaf and on the theme of the acorn. Um, the northern red oak has an acorn cap that looks kind of like a French beret. It's very shallow. The white oak has a thick, kind of warty, um, very substantial cap. And the chestnut oak has a bowl-shaped cap that's very thin. Now, this is the scarlet oak. This is our official DC tree. <clears throat> this is a very old tree next to the Western Ridge Trail in Rock Creek Park. This tree also has ski tracks. They're not quite as identifiable as the northern red, but the northern red oak is much more common than the scarlet oak. The scarlet oak is a, a tree of uh, dry upland woods. The leaf there you can see is very deeply lobed, um, like the um, pin oak. Those are the two with the really deep lobes. There's also the schumard oak has lobes that grows in the floodplain. It's very uncommon here. And I love the acorn of the um, scarlet oak. It looks like a child's top. The cap comes way down. And then there are like these concentric circles around the tip of it. Another tree that's really fun to, to observe in the winter is the flowering dogwood. 
the the flower buds of the flowering dogwood are, are like little onions or I think of them, I know this is really a stretch, but <laughs> they remind me of Eastern Orthodox um, church steeples because they're rounded and then they come to a point. And if you watch them through the winter, in the spring, those bud scales open up into the showy bracts of the flowering dogwood. And then of course, um, you know, we have this reward after winter comes spring and there's nothing like spring in Washington, really. I mean, in Vermont, spring doesn't really start until mid-April and it's, you know, you blink your eyes and it's summer. We have this long leisurely spring. It has started now. The elms and maples are blooming. The skunk cabbage is up. Spring has started. You know, it's not, we still have five weeks till the equinox, but, but spring has really started here. Now, this picture of Susan's, which she took from the Taft Bridge, looking down into Rock Creek, it always makes me think of the Robert Frost poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay. The first line of that poem is, nature's first hue is gold, her hardest hue to hold. When the leaves first come out, um, they, they have all these different colors before they settle into their green. And you can see it here, the, all the shades of gold. And here in these um, newborn oak leaves, um, you can see, and it's kind of like what happens in the fall. The chlorophyll isn't really cooking yet. So these other pigments can shine. So when you're, you know, when you're observing trees in the early spring, pay attention to all those different colors because they're soon gone and we soon settle down to a uniform green. Um, I love these pictures of Rock Creek Park through the seasons. This is uh, Susan's celebration of, of the bridges. Okay, now we're going to go to the Potomac Gorge. Um, I'm working on a book now about the Potomac Gorge. Um, it'll be similar to um, some other books where I do like a year-long memoir. Um, the Potomac Gorge, most people don't even know what it is. Um, it's not Mather Gorge. Mather Gorge is the narrow gorge right south of Great Falls. And that is like a gorge within a gorge because it's within the Potomac Gorge. But the Potomac Gorge goes from Great Falls to Theodore Roosevelt Island, and it takes the Potomac River from the, from the Piedmont, the hilly Piedmont, down to the coastal plain. So it's a very dramatic stretch of the river. And if you're aware of the whole thing as a gorge, you really can appreciate it. You know, if you're up in the Palisades, if you're on the uh, George Washington uh, Memorial Parkway, and it has amazing trees. This is a sycamore. Um, on the river trail, um, just just um, up from from um, Great Falls, and this is Betsy Lovejoy. She is a twin. She has a twin sister, and this was her birthday, and she's here with this twin sycamore celebrating her her birthday, her twin birthday. Um, this is in Riverbend Park, which is on the Virginia side of the river. And my favorite um, site in the gorge in the winter are what I call ghost trees. Now, ghost tree is actually another name for the sycamore. And you can really see it in the winter in the Potomac Gorge. I'm looking here across from Turkey Run Park to the Maryland shore and all those whitened trees. Now, when the spring comes, they will be obscured by leaves. But in the winter, they are just fabulous. And even if you're just driving across the American Legion Bridge, if you peek out, you don't want to get into a car wreck, but <laughs> if you just peek out at the river, you will see um, the ghost trees. Um, are you giving me my warning? Give me Anna? the five-minute five minute five minute warning. warning. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, and my favorite time in the Potomac Gorge is in the winter. Um, this is a river birch. I didn't talk about it in Rock Creek Park. It is common in, you know, in the floodplain of Rock Creek Park as well. It's almost horizontal. A lot of these floodplain trees can grow almost horizontally. And in the winter, you see these preformed catkins. Those contain the male flowers um, that will, will burst forth in the spring. Um, this is a bitternut hickory. Um, the, we have three common hickories here, the bitternut, mockernut, and pig nut, and the bitter nut is the one that grows in the floodplain. The mocker nut and pig nut are more common in the uplands. I love the um, hickory buds, and they're very diagnostic in the winter. The bitter nut hickory is a mustard yellow. The mocker nut is, is like shaped like an egg and kind of the color of a hen's egg. 
and you can see the bark in the background. The uh, pig nut is, is shaped like the mocker nut, but it's smaller and it's a little darker brown. And then my friend Kate Maynor, I don't know if she's with us today, but she's a naturalist who probably many of you know. Um, she, she describes hickory twigs as being wiggly. So these are wiggly hickory twigs. Um, and, and you can really appreciate them when they get a little snowfall, which I hope they will get. <laughs> um, this is the Billy Goat Sea um, Trail in the winter. And those are fox footprints on the left. I saw the footprints and then I smelled the fox musk. And oh, I was in heaven on this day. This was after our big snowstorm last January, a year ago. And when I was walking down this trail, a whole flock of bluebirds came in and started shaking snow down on me. Um, Olmstead Island is a really special habitat. And when you walk across the bridge, you walk across this part of the Potomac Gorge, you can see a lot of trees here that are just perched in the rocks. There are Virginia pines, um, eastern red cedar. There are some oaks there on the left. I can see some American sycamores. And then you walk on this boardwalk to, to get out to Great Falls and you're going through this fragile, it's a rare habitat, a bedrock terrace forest. Um, it's the ancestral bed of the Potomac River and it's a, it's a habitat where it gets flooded every 20 years or so. So the soil never builds up and the trees are all kind of stunted and fanciful. This is my favorite Virginia pine on Olmstead Island. And now we're gonna conclude at the um, Capitol grounds which are amazing for trees. Um, they were landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted. The, the island is named for his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. And both the Olmsteads had huge influence in our area. We owe them a great debt of gratitude for all of the um, places that they saved and you know, their really sensitive landscaping and just their philosophy. Um, on, on the Capitol grounds, there are 40 trees that, that date back to Frederick Law Olmsted's time there in the 1870s and 80s. And I've been going there for over 40 years. Um, and I, you know, this is, a, this is a giant sequoia that was planted by the Cherokee Nation in honor of um, Sequoia, who is a, just an incredible person and leader. And, um, it was planted on the 200th anniversary of his birth in the 1960s. So that's a picture of it in 79. And then um, last week in, in 2023, this is a 105 year old pecan tree on the Capitol grounds. Um, and uh, it's the state tree of Texas. There are many centenarians on the, on the grounds. And then this is a horse chestnut. There are also very many um, commemorative trees on the grounds. And this is a tree that was it's propagated from a tree that Anne Frank um, could see outside her window when she and her family were held in the annex. I mean, when they were in hiding in the annex, hiding from the Nazis during World War II. And in her famous diary, she wrote about this, this horse chestnut that she could see outside her window. It came down in 2010 and they estimated it was 170 years old. And um, they propagated from seeds from it, and one of them came to the Capitol grounds. Look at that bud. And if you touch it, it's got like sticky resin on the scales. Um, and um, Stella mentioned, you know, the catalpas, and I can't remember, you mentioned another tree. Oh, the walnuts. Winter fruit is, you know, we, we still see a lot of winter fruit. And especially like on the legume or pea family trees, the black locusts, the red buds. This is a Kentucky coffee tree. And if you can see me, this is the, <laughs> this is the size of the, the legume. It's a Kentucky coffee tree on the uh, Capitol grounds. And then um, these are all magnolia buds from um, native Eastern North American magnolias. They're all in the Capitol grounds. Of course, the Southern magnolia in the center, which is um, evergreen and the best known. And then on the lower left is the big leaf um, and then, and then the umbrella in the, in the um, upper left, and then the cucumber magnolia and the sweet bay magnolia. All the magnolias have fuzzy buds, except for the umbrella magnolia it has a smooth, glabrous bud. And then the star and saucer magnolias, which are going to be blooming very soon, and hopefully they won't bloom and then get hit by a freeze, which sometimes happens. They bloom very early, and they have fuzzy buds that are just asking to be touched. <laughs> Um, and the, the maple trees are, all, are blooming now. The, the red maples and the silver maples are blooming now. 
Um, those are the buds on the left on the Capitol grounds. But wherever you go in the next few weeks, you're going to see a red haze from the flowering red maples. And if you're down along our rivers and streams, you will see the silver maples. I was at Great Falls yesterday on the river trail, and I found all of these silver maple twigs in the trail that squirrels had chewed off because the sap is running. Um, and here's a burr oak. This is, might be my favorite oak in Washington. It's at the base of the Capitol. This is the acorn. Quercus macrocarpa means big fruit. <laughs> it's amazing. And um, this tree, my, I've been trying to verify, um, but I haven't been able to verify. It might be the oldest, largest uh, tree in Washington. It's a white oak. It's just, look, it's just in someone's yard on Northampton Street Northwest. And what a magnificent tree. Some estimates have placed it at 400 years. So I hope I didn't go on too long. <laughs> and these are, these are my seven book babies. They're also behind me here. Um, all of my books are about nature in Washington and I have winter trees throughout, not, you know, through in very, very prominently featured in all my books because I love the winter trees. So, Melanie, Melanie, thank you. Worth, 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 worth every, every second. second. Thank you. I think, I think it, is there an echo when I speak? There is. Uh, Anna, do you want to go ahead and transition then? So sure. That thank you so much, people. Melanie. That was fantastic. I've seen so many of your presentations, but I always learn something new. So thank you. Um, we're going to, um, you can stop sharing your screen now. Okay, will do. And then Alonzo, if you want to queue up your slides, we're really excited to hear from you. Great. So hopefully you guys can see that. It's opening up. Okay. There we go. Go ahead and put it your put it in. Uh, there you go. Slide mode. All right. All right. Kind of weird. I I see copies of stuff on the side. Maybe you guys don't. I hope you don't. Um, uh, well, can you put it in the uh, slide view mode? I or did, and that did? that's what happened. Unfortunately, unless you want to share them, and I'll just and I'll just say next, next, next. I can always do that if you like. Okay. All right, if you got on, I will stop sharing then. Okay, you stop sharing and I will share. Let's do the handoff here. Let me go find it on mine. There we go. And I just wanted to let everyone know in my hopefully not echoey voice anymore that we will we will uh, finish at one. I know some of you have a hard stop at one, including Alonso, but Anna and I will stay on till 1.15 if folks have any questions or you have some interesting trees to talk about. So if you want to jump off at one, completely understand. We'll hang out to chat if you'd like to stay with us. Yeah, yes, folks, I, I do have, my lunch break is over. So one o'clock, I got another meeting. So that that is it. However, if you guys do have questions in the chat or something, then they'll eventually get back to me. Um, but but again, uh, as soon as Anna, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll I'm tell get, you guys. I'm oh, no, yeah. no problem. In the meantime, just uh, a couple of things about me. I'll, I'll talk a little about them on there. Um, I only have a, uh, you know, I only have one uh, self-published book and that's, uh, you know, on reptiles and amphibians. I'm a generalist, so it's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, not like that. However, I do have one which I was hoping to get done this spring. It's all on spring wildflowers. However, it more and more work keeps getting in front of the way. And so I may not be able to get it done this spring. But if it is, I'm hoping to release it through the Virginia Native Plant Society. Um, you, we'll, they'll, they'll announce it when it's released or something like that. Uh, but but again, I don't know if that'll happen. But I am going to talk about some of the beauty match winter trees. The great thing about a lot of this is that Melanie has covered a lot of it. And so I don't, you know, I, I won't try to repeat the stuff that she's already said. So let's go on to the next one. Um, just again, some uh, some very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to promote some of the stuff that I do. I do work as, as the Natural Resource Manager on the county. However, I'm doing this on my own behalf as part of the Capital Naturals. If you don't follow me, you know, I think you should you should think about doing it because there's a lot of neat things there. Lots of great naturalists in there. Lots of great observations. And uh, it, it's a fun group where I was an interpreter for most of my life. I taught classes, 500 a year, things like that. And and now that I can't do it because I'm an office junkie and I'm stuck behind a computer, this is my escape is to use the Capital Naturalist. On to the next one, please. So the first one I want to relay is actually a story. And it's a long time story. It's a, told by the Seneca people, which is one of the Haudenosaunee, uh, one of the, uh, what people call some things, the Iroquois people. And it's about the legends of the evergreens. And I only made a couple of 
exceptions for this because some of their trees are different from ours. So for example, um, they have larch up there, which is a conifer, and we don't down here. So I use bald cypress, which although it's planted in our area, you know, it's more of a southern tree, is found in our area. So uh, again, just a quick legend about this. The story goes something like this. Uh, and I, you know, obviously stories do get told differently over the time. Um, but uh, it, it goes back to a long time ago when there was a war going out between the spirits of winter and the spirits of summer. And the war would constantly be raging with about half the time one, uh, one group winning and half the time um, another group winning. So the winter time, about half the time they'd win, about half the time the winters, the, the spirits of, of, of summer would win. And during all of this, there were a few tribes that decided they wanted to take sides on this. While mo most remained neutral, did not do anything, a couple did. And one of the more, more famous of them were the conifer tribe. The conifer tribe, which, which produced cones, thus the name conifer, um, they greatly wanted to support the spirits of summer. And so they had a, a tribal meeting, and in it, they invited all of the members of the tribe, and they were sitting there saying, we wanted to show resistance, and one of the ways we can do this is by drinking this magical elixir, we'll make it up, we'll do it, and it'll allow us to remain green all winter long. Now, upon hearing about this, some other trees decided they may want to participate, one of which included the American beach. And the American beach came over there and he said, we would love to participate in your protest and so forth to show support for the spirits of, of summer. Can we do that? And while most of the conifer tribes said that is a great idea, in, in particular White Pine, who was their leader. However, uh, a couple of them did not. In this case, the bald cypress said, look, he's not a member of our tribe. Therefore, he should not have these rights to be part of us. Now, most of the conifer tribe decided that allies were better than anything else. So they allowed them to remain. But in great protest, bald cypress left the meeting. OK, so they decided they make up this maxwell elixir and they give it out uh, to the, you know, to, to the members of the tribe. They held one dose back in case bald cypress changed his mind, but they all drank the all drank it, but they did allow, uh, they didn't uh, allow enough of it to go around for some of the other Marcescent trees. And we'll talk about Marcescent in a second, which was mentioned by Melanie already. And so things like the beech and the oaks and the, and the, and, and the ironwoods, they, um, they wanted to, to, to protest, but they were not given the elixir. So Winter comes along and it's one of the worst winters ever, especially when the spirits of winter decide that many of these rebels were speaking against them. So it was the coldest, windiest, most brutal winter that uh, that that memory remembers. And in it, they just would the winds would howl and blow branches and leaves and everything off the tree. But the uh, that but not for the conifers. The conifers, having taken their elixir, remain green and stout the whole time. That is all except the bald cypress, since he refused to take the the elixir. He is one of he is one of our only. Um, deciduous conifers that we have in our area. So he still loses his, its leaves. Um, now, the other ones that did not get it, for example, as I mentioned, the beech, the oaks, the ironwoods, they remained, you know, they still held on to the leaves for as long as they possibly could. And while they were, and while they were doing it, I mean, the wind would blow, this, that, whatever, but still by the end of the year, you could see that the oaks and the beeches and some of them held on to their leaves throughout the whole winter. And, um, this was something pretty special. Finally, the spirits of summer won. Uh, many other trees enjoy, enjoyed it, and they look back upon this. And since then, the evergreens have always remained the evergreens, except for a couple like the larch and the cypress who, who, who did not partake in it. And many of the ones who decided to, part, um, to actually take part in the protest, including the oaks and the beaches and the ironwoods, they re remain more sensitive, holding on to their dried leaves for the, um, you know, uh, for the remainder of, of the year. Now, the final piece of this is when you tell the story, that's all fine and Danny, it's an interesting legend and so forth. But they say for those people who know the story, then something special does happen. Because if you listen hard enough, when the winter is really, really blowing and it's going through the trees and the leaves are rustling and so forth, what you may notice, or at least that's what the Seneca people say, is that the leaves aren't actually just rustling. What they're doing is they're laughing. They're laughing at the spirits of winter because they know eventually summer will win and they will come back in their all glory. And so the next time you're going through there and the, we, the leaves are rustling uh, you through the marcescent leaves of, of the trees that hold on to them, guess what? What you're really listening is their, their, their re rebellious laughter that they are holding on to the leaves because eventually they will win. 
So that is a legend of how, you know, some trees hold on to leaves and some trees don't. And again, it's not for me, it's an old story. And again, it just, I, I, I learned this first story uh, from Brosha Bruchak or whatever from the Keeper series, which is an interesting uh, educational series on Native American tales and so forth. Anyways, going on to the next slide, please. Um, so again, on my blog, I have a lot of things covered. I put some in the chat about some of the stuff that Melanie had talked about or whatever, but I do have this blog and you can find out about the legend and you can find out about, uh, about some of this by just uh, going back to it. Uh, here is a link to that. But let's go on to the next one. So I'm going to start off again, one of these, and that's the Quercus. In this case, it's white oak. And again, um, you know, uh, Melanie did a great job telling you a lot about it. You can see the distinctive bark and some of the older trees here, all these things that hang down on it and so forth. So, but white oak also is an incredibly important uh, member of, of our family. If, if something does happen and we do lose all the oaks, it would be horrible for wildlife because there's over 600 species that exclusively only feed on oaks. So if the oak, if something comes by, like something like the American chestnut blight or something like that, that wipes off the whole species, we would instantly overnight lose 600 exclusive species. However, there are some species which may survive just using alternate hosts. So as an example, if you look at oaks, you find that, that they host 557 caterpillar species, according to Doug Tallamy. There is 805 gall-making species that make their own edible homes as there were on this with distinctive growth, many of them with, with distinctive oak trees. And most of these are cinnamon wasps, so tiny that many of them can fly right through the, the eye of a, uh, of a needle, but, uh, but they're there and they don't harm anything, but they're there. There are 40 some mammal species to feed on those glorious acorns. And, and again, they may feed on other stuff, but they prefer them more than anything else. And when there's mast years, when the years produce a ton of fruit, you can tell because a lot of these animals do so well. And um, the last little piece of it is over 60 different kinds of birds. Again, specific 61 wood boring beetles, 21 leafhopper species, 37 tree hoppers, marcescens I've already mentioned. This was used in for barrel making in particular um, because uh, it, it was great. It holds um, it, it holds uh, water very well because of the way it grows. That's true of the white oaks, but not true of the red oaks. But this is a white oak, and the, mo the more popular one you see around here. And also, big difference between red oaks and white oaks, besides just the tips on red oaks, uh, what red oaks and black oaks, which which Melanie only mentioned, the little barb on on the end of them, um, that which white oaks lack. Uh, they they these guys produce acorns every year, whereas in red red black oaks they produce that family produces them um, every other year. So again, lots of things on white oaks, very very important. And just one more little piece of it, and I promise I'll go on. I can talk about these things forever. And that is, folks, we do need to preserve some of this. And this is a keystone species tree. If anyone's read a lot of stuff that Doug Tallamy says, not only can you see here because of all the things that it supports, but I'll give you an example how that leads to something else. So. Look at those 557 caterpillar species which feed on the different oak species and, and some others too, but that too, right? They then feed 96% of our ground nesting birds, 96%, including many of the birds that maybe people think, oh, okay, they feed on something else, on seeds, whatever. However, the best thing for growing birds is caterpillars. And those caterpillars translate to needing the native trees that they evolve with for these caterpillars to survive and then feed 96% of the birds that are out there. Okay, so that's a good example of how, you know, in interesting that is. And by the way, we have 18 local species of bats, right? All of them feed on insects and most of them feed on moths. And what are moths? Moths are adult caterpillars, okay? Butterflies and moths are adult caterpillars. So again, a very important species, white oak, probably the most important species that we have from an ecological standpoint on our end. Okay, enough about white oaks. On to the next one, please. So again, in the story, I'm making American Beach. And here's a little bit about American Beach itself. Uh, again, it holds still a good number of species, 127 caterpillar species, tons of different things, that are, including some things that we no longer have, like the passenger pigeon. It is deer assistance. And that's why many of our, uh, of our, um, tr uh, of our forests are, are starting to be dominated by beech and such because the deer are eating many of the other types of species, such as the oaks. And so beech uh, is surviving, but it's not fire resistant. And since we suppressed fire in most of our areas, it has such thin bark. Um, that's, you know, of course, unfortunately people like to carve into, which is bad for the, <laughs> for the tree. Um, it's not fire resistant. And so that's limited too. It is marcescent. Um, people used to lose these leaves because they're long lasting. They would use them actually in, um, 
in, in, for making mattresses and so forth. They said that not, not only that, but it supposedly kept things uh, very smelling good and was easy to replace as well as being pest resistant. So it was used for mattresses and so forth for the longest time. We already mentioned, she already mentioned the long pointy, um, you know, um, buds on this. Here are what the nuts look like. Um, but I wanted to mention one other thing. That's the root, the, the words for this. So American beach, Fagus is, is the, 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 um, the, the genus name, you know, for that family, for all the beaches, right? And Fagus actually uh, Greek for good to eat because these nuts are edible. Now around here, they do not produce mast years. They don't produce um, these mass numbers on most years, but they are edible. Um, and beach itself, it's got the same root, root word as books. And again, why? Because people would carve in them. People would make would make things out of it. It's just one of those things uh, by itself. So again, um, the wood's also very, very heavy for its size. Uh, it, it's very, very strong, but you can, by steaming it, bend it. So it, it is useful for all sorts of tools. Um, it also is used for lots of things that contain food. Why? It doesn't have any real flavor or odor to it. And it, this, along with oaks, have a lot of tannins in them. And so that that uh, that meant that it was used for uh, for tanning leather and that sorts of things as well. There's some legends that kind of keep uh, that kind of happen uh, for it. Uh, for example, um, there's a superstition: if you plant this near a house, then that would keep the lightning at bay. And so people would plant some of this near their houses to kind of keep that in there. And oh, I didn't mention that these the, these nuts are edible. However, for some people, in particular, if you eat it too much, there is a process, and they're called phaging. It's phagus, and thus they has this this chemical in it called phaging, which makes it slightly narcotic. And for some people, if you eat large amounts of it, it is not good for you. So just that warning if you decide to do some foraging and doing that kind of thing. Oh, and by the way. The nuts were also used in the South, in particular during the Civil War and things like that, when they could not get a lot of other things um, that, that because of the, the bans or whatever and, and, the, and, and uh, them not be able to ship anything. Um, they, Francis Porcher wrote, uh, wrote a book on an ethnobotany, things that they use for themselves. And in it, he mentions use of, uh, of this as a coffee substitute. Okay, on to the next one, please. So the next one we're going to talk about is holly. Easy to tell. It's all over. It has a lot of common names. It only holds 39 caterpillar species, but that's still good. But again, 49 different kind of bird species love to feed on it. However, they don't all feed on it at the same time. This holds on to these red berries for the longest time. Why? Well, some people claim that the birds don't find them very edible. And so they're the last ones that they consume. But when they do, so for example, when late February, early March and the my and the my um the uh, robins are going through areas, they'll stop on a tree and strip it bare. And it is funny when you do that, and the mockingbirds have staked out that tree and they're trying to fight, fight off a hundred robins and lose eventually, but they're trying to save onto it because by then, maybe because of winter, uh winter time and maybe it's starvation food, whatever they want to, this becomes a very important important uh, food element for it. So yes, it lasts a long time. It's not a preferred food, but it does uh, happen. And by the way, for most uh, holly trees, the only exception I can think of is Nellie Stevens, which is a hybrid where all of the trees um, bear, bear berries. Um, only the female trees bear, uh, bear berries. So again, uh, that's American holly. Moving on to the next one, please. Hey, Alonzo, um, I just want to let you know it's 1257. I know you yeah. have a hard stop at one. So I'm just giving yeah. you that. Let me up. see. Yeah, let me see how hard I am. And I just go through it very, very quickly. And then again, you can at least read the notes for what it's worth. And then I'll, I'll click off immediate one. Virginia pine, again, very, very common. Lots of names for it, 201 caterpillar species. Uh, the Cherokee, um, it, there is a great book by Daniel Mormon who put together North American ethnobotany and uh, American Indian ethnobotany, all about how the indigenous people used them. And again, he mentions how the Cherokee used it for worms, for rheumatism, for colds, all of these kinds of things. So again, it was a, a it was an important thing for them kind of strange um if you break off a, a a stem of it you see that it spells va one two um v for virginia and because it's twisted and only has two it's an easy identification thing to tell it apart from the other pines that we have of which we only have a few local pines which are supposed to grow here lots planted but only a few local ones um and again it holds on to its uh, cones throughout the year at multiple levels it takes almost two years uh, for um for them to um to to mature so it holds on to these for the longest time and that's another good way to identify them okay on to the next one 
Eastern redbud, again, lots of different things to it. It's actually juniper, 42 species, but my God, over 90 different kinds of birds. When it first starts growing, it's young and pointed, older, much older. It's got flat shape to it. So again, lots of uses. The old ones used to be used for gin. Again, some superstitious use it for. You would keep it at your door. Why? Because keep witches at bay. Um, it also, they said that what witches would have to do to get by you, they'd have to count all of the individual needles on there. And if they did that, then they could get into your home. So anyways, Lots of different things through there. Um, Francis Porter already mentioned uh, would use it. Uh, you'd mix it uh, together, 300 berries with uh, 38 uh, um, gallons of water, and you could make what he said one of the most wholesome liquors in all time. And again, they, they had to import lots of different things, and as a substitute for gin and whatever, you could make your own, you know, southern gin out of this stuff as well. Okay, and the next one, please. And I think I'll leave right after that. So again, American sweet gum, kind of a cool thing. Um, as I already mentioned, 35 caterpillar species. It's named because of the pleasant odor of the sap. Okay, um, you know, that's why it's called sweet gum. Uh, but you can make gum out of it, although I tried it and it's more medicinal than anything else. It's horrible. The, the flavor sticks in your mouth forever. Very recognizable in the fall, not only because of the, the changes of its leaves with the, with the five fingers on it that looks very easy, but because the young stems all have winged stems on them, which makes them pretty distinctive. Um, they used to dip this in whiskey to cure diarrhea. And, and again, lots of neat things about them. So American sweet gum trees, long lasting uh, sweet gum balls, which the birds like to feed on as well. Okay, on to the uh, next one. River birch, and I'll, I'll stop at this one. Again, very, very common tree, a, 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 a riparian tree, also called black birch, water birch, 411 caterpillar species, but birds feed on it too. I've seen them do this. It's kind of a neat thing. The wood itself was useful for all sorts of things, including for flooring. Why? Because it can polish really, real well. In, App in Appalachia, this was used for treating, uh, for treating um, rheumatism. It was astringent, so they also would use it for muscle sprains, uh, you know, sore muscle, things like that as well. And the American Forest Association chose birch for its first mother tree of America in 1920. So lots of neat things about uh, river birch and so forth. And again, if there's any questions or whatever about any of these things, I know I kind of rushed through there, please add them to the chat. Last little uh, slide on there. It's just to promote, again, Capital Naturalist. And I do apologize for me uh, rushing off, but lunchtime only lasts for so long, and I got to go into this next meeting. So thank you all for the invitation, and I hope to catch up with you very, very soon in the future. Thanks thank so you. much, Alonzo. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Bye-bye, folks. Have a, great, have a great next meeting. Thank you, Alonzo. Thank you. Bye. Melanie, if you can stay with us for longer. Sure, sure. Thank you to everyone who, who joined us. And if you have to leave at one, we understand. And if you want to stay on with us, then we get to uh, answer, ask and answer some really interesting questions with Melanie. So uh, let's go on to the slightly less formal part of our program. Should I stop the recording or keep it going? Let's keep it going. We okay. might have some interesting questions. Thank you know, you. we had a question in the chat that um, Alonso was possibly going to answer, but Melanie, I wonder if you know it. Um, Elizabeth asked that she has a whole bunch of chickadees uh, in one of her trees. And Elizabeth, if you're on, I can't remember the type of tree. Um, I think, was it a muscle wood? Yes. I think it was muscle a muscle wood. wood. Yes. So I, I was wondering if they were eating the little nutlets because that tree produces little tiny nutlets that are attached to this leafy bract. And, and I'm guessing they're probably eating those. But, you know, I'm afraid there are going to be a lot of Alonzo questions now. <laughs> he's so, so knowledgeable. If there are any questions that we can't answer, we're going to um, save the chat and we'll follow up with Alonzo. And we'll be sending out a follow-up email to anyone who registered with the recording, as well as a whole bunch of links to resources. Resources about uh, Melanie's books and her website and um, Alonzo's uh, sites as well. So there were a few other questions. I know some of them may have been answered by Master Naturalists, but if you see any, feel free to put them forward to Melanie. I see, why do street trees need structural branch trimming? Multiple leads? I don't know if that's a Melanie question. Yeah, I don't know. So That's more of an urban forestry question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, is there? Do we have we any have on the people? call? I think it has to do with you know not um, interfering with um, wires and things, right? The poles and electrical wires and things. That's why they would be trimming things. I would think. 
Um, but if there's if there if we have an arborist on the call or if we have any uh, tree stewards, feel free to um, chime in. You know, I have a, a question, maybe it's more of an observation, and I'm looking at Kathy Sykes, and that, that's what made me think of it, is, you know, one of the things we say is leave the leaves, right? And many of you are probably doing this already. But in the winter, if you have a tree in your backyard, it's kind of wonderful if you can leave all of those leaves under the tree. And Melanie, I wonder if you could address why that's so important. Oh, yeah, just ecologically, it's so good for the soil. It's absolutely so good for the soil to have the enrichment of all of those fallen leaves. And, and I imagine also for insect life and um, if there's an ecologist um, who could, you know, answer this more specifically, but it's, it's just good for every, everything. <laughs> it's the natural way. Kathy, Kathy mentions a winter habitat. Yeah, so it's a place for like lots of little critters to kind of hang out. Um, uh, so I, it makes me really sad where I live because when they, I see them coming down our street with the, with the leaf blowers, I get really sad because to me, it's like murder. <laughs> so I try not to, um, but anyway, um, it looks like Kathy, did you have something else you wanted to add? I, would, I, would, I was just going to say Talamade's uh, book on the nature of oaks talked about actually the leaves suppressing an invasive uh, Japanese stilt grass, which oh, yeah. is amazing. This doesn't get rid of it if you've already got it, but it's actually a preventative thing for yes. avoiding invasive. But it also, the leaves also, we still have heavy rains if it doesn't snow, which it hasn't for a while. Um, but it, leaving the leaves uh, keeps the moisture in there's a whole bunch of nutrients you don't need to mulch and there's so many bad things that i actually i'm doing an article now for or a column for for uh forest chills connection about leaving the leaves and about avoiding the blowers because it is like a hurricane for the little insects and the, the it's like 200 miles per hour those little blades go even when they're the electric ones not the gas so there's so many bad things that we should avoid doing and nobody vacuums you've heard that the forest so why do we think a tool that was devised or created invented in japan for construction sites is fine on our gardens and i'm going crazy um and i think maybe stella knew this but there's been all so many of my native plant gardens along connecticut avenue um that were planted with bushes and shrubs People have cut them to the ground, and this is again winter habitat for all the insects and so forth, and food for the birds. Um, and then they've thrown mulch and removed the leaves. So I'm just like, so DDOT needs to work with DOEE, is my feeling um, about who controls and says what can grow there. Because, yeah, we could do better. <laughs> well, you are a very, you are an extremely eloquent spokesperson. I Ooh. wish you could come to my neighborhood and walk up and down the street and talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Benjamin writes, it's also good to build habitats for animals by stacking branches and twigs in teepee like structures um, in your backyard. Um, Linda writes, Linda, uh, leaves and wood feed the mycelium. So the all the little things that are going on underneath the world wood web uh, underneath. Um, someone, uh, Ellen asks, do you, you know anything about the massive ginkgo growing in the tiny triangular park at 19th and Pennsylvania? Trying to think where that is, 19th and Pennsylvania. I'm I going there. I'm going there for Valentine's dinner at Founding Farmers, so I will check it out. Yeah, and I'll yeah. let you know, Anna, and maybe you could get into. Yeah, we can pass that along. Yeah. We'll find out like what's the story. <laughs> I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. What is it? 19th and 20th. 19th and 19th and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's right. right. Where I'm going for dinner. That's right. We're Founding Farmers. <laughs> um, there was a question. Does anybody know if um the eastern red cedar berries are birds that uh, like to wait till later because they're not as yummy, like the yeah. holly? I don't question. know if I yeah I don't know if that's true or not. It it could be. I just don't know the answer. I've noticed to that. them still on our our pretty, trees as well. Pretty sure cedar wax wings will eat them whenever they're ripe. Ah, okay, good to know. I love smelling them. They smell so much like gin. When you pick one of those berries and just uh, I was getting thirsty them. when when um, Alonzo was describing making <laughs> the booze out of them. I'm like, oh, we should all make we should have a little Valentine's Day cocktail with this. Um, yeah, and I am just back from the uh, badlands of Western North Dakota, where the Rocky Mountain juniper grows. It's very closely related to the Eastern red cedar and that they're beautiful. They're, they grow into big trees out there in the badlands and they're loaded with um, with the they're actually it's not fruit. It's it's like it's the little blue berry like cone. 
Um, and, um, you know, and, and a lot of uh, animals and birds are feasting on them out there. It was really fun to see that sister species. That's awesome. Yeah. Do we have any it's other fun. questions in the, I'm just kind of going through, people have had different comments. Any other questions while we have Melanie on the line or you can even put questions um, in the chat for, for Alonzo that we could follow up with. And I would also love to hear about any, I would love to hear about any favorite trees that people have, you know, that they especially appreciate in the winter. And thank you, Joanne, for um, popping something, an, an NWF article in the chat about juniper berries. So we appreciate that. Oh, let me go back to the beginning when we were asking people about um, their So while you're, there were some favorites listed, but I just want to kind of like swoon over river birches. And Melanie, I wonder, so in my neighborhood in Mount Pleasant, for some reason, the river birches are doing really well as street trees. And I don't really know why. My theory is because we have leaky water pipes. So they have, my theory is that they have like an un, unofficial kind of underground water source that's feeding them. But when I look at them in the winter and you look at all those wonderful flaky catkins, kind of, the cat, yeah. Are you talking just, about the catkins or the bark? The bark. The Oh, the bark. I know but the bark is about the catkins. I mean, yeah, it's the, just so the catkins. Tree. Yeah, I had a, I, I, I love the bark, Stella. I love the bark too. Um, and then the catkins, they're the, um, they're, they're like little forked, skinny little forked things. I, I had a picture. It was just a pretty small picture. And they're, they're on the ends of these delicate twigs. And those are the male flowers. They're preformed, you know, in the summer, fall of the previous year, and they will be there until the girl catkins come out in the spring, and then they will elongate and release their pollen. And they're just really fun to watch in the winter, and the twigs are so delicate, so when the wind blows, you know, they dance, the catkins dance. Yeah, it's a beautiful tree. A couple of the observations that people made, um, Kimberly said she's watching from Charlottesville. She grew up near Sugarloaf and met Melanie after her book was published so she's met you so this that's cool um katie said she can't wait for the eastern red buds to start blooming those usually come up before the uh before our cherries um tanya mentioned february means red maple blossoms in the mountains of virginia um linda's watching from great falls and she loves the sycamores turning white against the gray like you were talking about the ghost trees melanie ghost trees. Um, one of my um you know, I've been on many of uh, Melanie's walks of uh, Theodore Roosevelt Island, and there's some very special sycamore trees that she brings us to um, out there um, that we've gotten some great pictures of. Uh, so I love, I think I'm always going to associate sycamores with you, Melanie, because I have seen the, probably the most pretty ones with you. Um, I felt bad I didn't have a picture of grandmother sycamore um, on Theodore Roosevelt Island, which is one of our favorite trees. Definitely. Maybe uh, I think uh, Stella and I probably have pictures of it. We could probably put it in the follow up email. Um, uh, Christy mentioned she loves the steely white American sycamores in winter, especially along the Sino Canal and the um, Potomac north of Georgetown. Beaches in winter have a special personality with their shimmering marcescence. So I love the discussion that we've had about about the beach. So, yeah, it looks like sweet gums um, and beach uh, super uh, and sycamore super popular in the chat. And with that, maybe we can go ahead and, and conclude. Anna, do you want to let people know about what we'll be following up with? Yeah, so we'll, we have a recording. Uh, we'll have a recording link of this that we will grab. We're going to share this with anyone who registered. Um, and so there are some of you that indicated that you want to post it and stuff. So let's, you know, let's, uh, we'd like to know where it gets posted. So we'll communicate with you on that, no problem. Um, and um, like I said, we're going to share some, um, some links uh, about all about what Melanie's talked about her books and her website and her activities, as well as um, the links that Alonzo shared. Um, I have, for those of you that are iNaturalist nerds or citizen science nerds, like a bunch of us, um, tonight is our monthly virtual iNat night. Um, we're talking about galls tonight. We're learning about galls, uh, those little formations, the little things on plants that house insects and such. It's really fun. Um, and that's tonight at, um, that's tonight from seven to eight thirty. So that's our monthly series that we have uh, using iNaturalist and making learning how to make identifications. And in a second, I'll put the link to that if you want to register for that. That's a free thing that we're doing. Um, Stella, did you want to mention um, Thursday's event? Do you want to mention that? Uh, sure. So uh, there's a regional network of citizen scientists. And on Thursday, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, we're going to be looking at citizen science as a conservation tool, because a lot of us are observing and 
And it turns out to be kind of an activist activity that you can actually protect biodiversity by tracking it as a citizen scientist. And we're going to have some great people talking about that. So if you have time out and put that in the Link, no, I put both to... links in. I put both links in the chat. Um, you, you can save the chat, folks. If you go to the bottom and click the three little dots at the bottom, that can save the chat locally to your computer. If you want to save any of the links, um, or go ahead and grab those. Um, we will send these links out. Also, depending on the timing of this follow-up email, I'm not sure when it's going out yet. So if we make it, we'll include these links. Um, otherwise, um, they're there for you to copy. Thank and you. I think we're good. It's 1:14. And Anna, finally, I'd like to give Melanie the last word. Melanie, I want to thank you so much. We could listen to you for hours. And so thanks so much for sharing your time and your stories and your knowledge. And uh, why don't you take us out on Valentine's Day and uh, oh, send us oh. off? Would you like me to read a poem, a Mary Oliver poem? Whatever you want to do. It's OK, your this is how I'd like to uh, conclude is with this wonderful Mary Oliver poem. I know a lot of us are. Mary Oliver fans, um, and this poem is called When I Am Among the Trees. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and they call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say, and you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you Thank guys you, so much. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Melanie, maybe you could stay on with us. Sure. Wonderful. Sure.